Hello everyone. I'm Rebecca Bunting, the Vice-Chancellor of the University of Bedfordshire, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this evening's event. Um, it's the second of our Evening with Public Lectures in this academic year. It's a real privilege to welcome this evening's speaker because we fondly regard him as one of our own. He is an alumnus of our university. He graduated with a BA Honours in Media, Performance and Radio in 2001. And it was at the university that he found his passion for broadcasting and, of course, where he met his now co-host, Ricky Hayward Williams. Together they've gone on to achieve great things and we are very proud of them. Melvin has always remained in touch with the university and we are grateful to him for dedicating so much of his time to the students of our university, contributing to our university campaigns and we were very proud and delighted to be able to award him an honorary Doctor of Arts in recognition of his outstanding contribution to broadcasting. That was in 2016. Melvin is currently best known as a BBC Radio One presenter. He's been hosting shows on Radio One uh, since April 2019. And a couple of years later, he progressed onto the famous Radio One Live Lounge slot, which I'm sure many of you will be familiar with. He previously hosted KISS FM's uh, breakfast show every weekday morning and that won a silver at the Sony Radio Awards in 2009 with the category of Breakfast Show Award. I'm sure some of you have woken up to that a few times. And it was consistently known as the UK, UK's biggest commercial breakfast show with two million listeners every week. We've got quite a lot of people today, but not quite that many. But he's not just a radio presenter. He's had an extensive CV of television presenting. He currently co-presents Got What It Takes on CBBC. And he's worked on many popular shows, such as ITV's Extra Factor, um, Channel 4's Lego Masters, Bang On The Money, and BBC 3's Sweat The Small Stuff, just to name a few. And his career has seen him host prestigious events such as ITV2's Red Carpet Show for the Brit Awards in 2015-16. And of course, who can forget him showcasing his dancing skills when he appeared as a contestant in the 14th series of Strictly Come Dancing. And he went on to win the Christmas special edition, so lots of good votes there for him. Alongside his work in radio and TV, Melvin has worked with some major global brands, most recently with eBay to highlight their small business initiative and Lego, which saw him travel to Denmark to host uh, the first ever Lego Con uh, to a global audience in June last year. So we're always very proud of our students at the University of Bedfordshire um, and the great things they go on to do. And of course, we couldn't be prouder of Melvin. He really is a true Beds role model. He's remained, as I said, very active with the university, supporting us in lots of ways, especially in our Proud to be Black campaign, which was a, a great experience. And he's offered masterclasses to students and lots of other things that are just so wonderful in terms of keeping in touch with the university community. So he's a very busy man and um, we are so grateful that he's found time to join us this evening. So. There will be a time uh, at the end for questions from the audience, which you're welcome to post as we go along in the chat line. Um, but before that, um, we're going to hear from three of our current students. They will introduce themselves and they're going to ask him a few questions, interrogate him about his life and his experiences. Um, but they are Toby, Jose and Annie. I'll let them speak for themselves, but over to them now. Thank you. Hello, my name is Toby Crabb. I am a third year uh, student here at the University of Bedfordshire studying radio and audio, and I'm one of the student managers here at Radio Lab. As, you, as I know, Melvin, you started here at Radio Lab at the University of Bedfordshire. Uh, so I'm really excited to have the opportunity to, to finally speak to you about all radio and everything at the University of Bedfordshire. But first, Melvin, how are you this evening? Yeah, I'm really good, and thank you guys for the amazing big up. You you feel make me feel like a um, like a nephew within the family, 
of the university. And I feel like Rebecca's my proud auntie. So no, thanks for having me tonight. And um, I hope I impart some, some wisdom today. No, thank you. No, thank you, Melvin, for being here. We appreciate it. Uh, may I ask, how was your university experience and how well did your time here at Bedfordshire prepare you for work in the media? Um, some people don't believe this, but uni was like the best time of my life um, for several reasons. I, when I started uni, I actually didn't know what I wanted to do. I always knew that I, I liked the idea of um entertaining people and performing but i didn't really know that i wanted to be a presenter until i got um to the university of bedfordshire i did media for radio with a minor in in radio sorry and um i just kind of it helped me focus that whole kind of like aspect of radio and performance and uh that's where i met ricky and that's where that kind of chemistry and partnership began um but for me it was also about those life skills uh, that you get when you're at university. And I think a lot of people will get that. I come from a very strict West African background. My mum wouldn't let me go to parties until I was a certain age. So when I left the house and I was living on campus for the first time, I went absolutely crazy. And I met some of the most amazing people in that time. Some people that I'm still really close with right now. I'm like godfather to some of those people now. Um, and you create a network of new creatives who go on to do the next big thing when you're, when you're at university. So it helped me focus what I wanted to do. It allowed me to meet amazing people. And it was just a really great time in my life. What opportunities would you say students should take here at the University of Bedfordshire to prepare them more for the radio and media lifestyle? Um, I say every opportunity. I mean, I know like yourself, you've been working at the Radio Lab when we were back at um, unit was called Luton FM. And like, it was just us messing around in the studio, but you don't realize how much you learn when you actually create real radio. Um, and so, yeah, if you get opportunities to do that, if you get opportunities to create shows, if you do stuff online, whatever it is, if there's an opportunity and it opens up, I say, take it, if that's what you want to do. And even if, it's, if you're not too sure about it, it allows you to work out whether or not you, you actually want to do it anyway. So any opportunity that's available to you, I will take it. And I, it doesn't even have to be anything directly connected to the uni itself. If you see a placement with the BBC or with ITV and you're interested, there's nothing stopping you from doing that. It, like We live in a completely different world now where you can create your own media. If you have an Instagram account, if you have... Uh, a YouTube account, you can create your own content. Um, so I'm talking very specifically about the media industry. I don't think you have to wait for anyone to give you a job or give you an opportunity. You create your own opportunities, I believe. Once you graduated, Melvin, what was the biggest challenge for you getting into the radio or media industry and how did you overcome those challenges? Well, that is, that's a good question. For me, it was actually starting out in the industry because there were a million and one young, sexy black guys like myself trying to get into the industry. And um, I remember when, when I left uni, One Extra had just started at the BBC and I went with my, you used to get these little books, Record of Achievement, and it had all your qualifications in, like you had your degree in there, it had your A-levels, your, your GCSE. And I, I went up to this building in central London and I was so proud of myself with you know, my degree under my belt and stuff. And um, I walked into this room and I met an exec from the BBC and he said, look Melvin, you seem like a very enthusiastic young man, but look at that corner. In that corner over there, there's five people who have done work experience in radio. He pointed to another corner, he said, that person there, they've created their own company, they're writing, this person's a journalist. And then I was just in a room of so many um, educated, creative um, people who had experience and I didn't have any experience when I left university and I had to build that experience up. But I was really, really lucky because what I didn't realize is I had this network of people like Ricky, who was already work, doing work experience at loads of different places. And he gave me an opportunity at One Extra when he was there. 
Uh, there was another young lady called Chanel Robinson who was in my class when I was doing media performance. And when we were at uni, she was applying for work placements at the BBC. And um, she was like, Melvin, I know you're really into acting. Why don't you come over to the BBC and work on this show called Dick and Dumb in the Bungalow? Um, and that was my first kind of like job in television. Um, and I used to dress up as, you know, like these crazy characters. And we ended up working on the show for like five years. The show won two BAFTAs. I'm still really close with the boys now. Off the back of that, we did another show called The Slammer. Off the back of that, loads of other jobs have come out of it. Um, and that was like my foundation. But what I had was a network. I didn't have experience, but I had a network. But because of I didn't have that experience and no one knew who I was, it did take a really, really long time to get into the industry. But I think if you decide to make that decision to become a broadcaster or a presenter or a DJ, you have to have the will to just keep going. There's going to be points in your life where you're like, like, should I really be doing this? Am I going to make money from this? Is this going to be, you know, is this a, a job that I can actually do that where I can support my, myself and my family? Um, and you'll ask yourself all these questions. But I think for me, I just kept going. I couldn't see myself doing anything else. Cheers, Melvin. I think I'm going to have to look up online for you now, being dressed in those funny costumes. You would say, <laughs> You'd have to look online. Yeah. <laughs> just go on YouTube. <laughs> You'll probably be dancing in costumes. <laughs> uh, we're celebrating uh, 25 years at Radio Lab, Melvin. Um, what was like the fondest moment in student radio you had here? Or like the funniest thing you did with us at Radio Lab? Um, we used to do pranks on other students um, and just call up people. And it sounds like such a simple thing, but it used to bring us so much joy. Um, and there's a, another guy that we used to work with called Charles Juf. Uh, we call him DJ Cut Class. And he used to do these amazing mixes on air, like live in front of you. And I just remember, I, we just felt like the coolest kids on campus. Like we were friends with this really cool DJ. So when we went to the clubs and we were around the university, it, you just felt like you were creating something really fresh and really interesting and innovative. And that's probably like my first taste of radio, my first taste of broadcasting. And like I said, that was like the first ever time that me and Ricky started doing, like working together as presenters. It was never a, pl a planned thing. Luton FM was the, the origins of that. And so when we worked together, it, it never felt like work, me and Ricks. It was just like a natural thing. So then when we left, we were like, actually, let's just do this. Like, it, it seems more fun when we do stuff together. Um, but yeah, that was the, the beginnings of all of that. May I ask Melvin, if it's all right, instead of your best moment, in radio mm -hmm. what was your worst moment you've experienced on live radio ah you're gonna ask me that <laughs> okay um okay so um when we were at kiss we used to have to do reads like adverts because of obviously it's commercial radio so everything's paid for and there was a film starring sandra bullock and at the time for some reason i couldn't pronounce her second name right so I'm not too sure if you can work out, instead of saying Bullock, I said a word very close to that repeatedly on air. And it was quite embarrassing. I don't know how I kept my job, uh, but that was probably like the most embarrassing time because also Ricky and Charlie didn't help me. They just kind of sat there laughing. And it was the first ever time our producer kind of left us to our own devices because uh, I think he had to do something else. So he came back and he was like, did anything happen? And I was like, yeah, I literally repeatedly on there so that was like probably the worst time actually there was another time when i forgot to press record during an interview for jamie fox um but that's another story in there we've all been there melvin um <laughs> last question for me um you've achieved a lot in radio it's safe to say uh but have you still got a, a goal what's the what's the what's the next aim for you in in radio have you got a goal so you still want to achieve you know what i i always I always say more of the same. I always feel like I'm really blessed to be doing what I'm doing. I get to do a show with my best mates. Ricky and Charlie are amazing broadcasters. I feel like I learn from them every single day. They make me smile every single day. Um, Radio One for me is the biggest station in, in the country, if not the world. I'm on such an important show, The Live Lounge, which is highly iconic. We've had massive stars on there. 
like Lizzo, like Mark Bronson, like Jay-Z. So to be part of that and um, to get to do that every single week, every single day is, is a big deal for me. So I always go more of the same, um, but just con to continue to be better at it and to keep learning from it and to ensure that our audience enjoy what we do. Cheers, Melvin. That was brilliant. Thank you. Thank you for so much for talking to us. And feel free to visit Radio Lab any time at all. Um, no worries, I'll, but you've got to pay me, right? <laughs> Cheers, Melvin. Well, I'll <laughs> hand over to Jose. <laughs> nice one. Thank you. Yes. Okay, I think it's. Can you hear me properly? How you doing? Hi, Melvin. I am Annie. I am a student studying media performance for film, TV, and theatre. Um, I know I speak for a lot of students when I say that we're so lucky to get the chance to speak to you today. Um, what I want to find out more from you is more about the industry you're in and what opportunities you think are out there. So for my first question, it's what were, what are the what were the biggest hurdles that you've had to face in the media industry as a whole? Um, I think there's been a variety of hurdles. I think the one that always sticks out for me was when I left university. That felt like a really scary time because you kind of finish and you feel like you're out there in the big wide world and everything's new and you don't know where to go. I think an important thing to do is have a focus on where you want to be and where you want to go, but also stay open to stuff as well. I remember when, we, when, when I left uni, I was like, the only place I want to be is one extra. And I didn't think about Radio One, I didn't think about KISS, I didn't think about Capital, all these other amazing places that existed. So I, I kept it really, really close. And I think if you are, decide to be a presenter, you, you can still do what you do on, on so many other platforms. And then when it felt like opportunities weren't there, it made me feel disheartened. But I feel like we live in a world now where, like I said before, you can create your own space. You, you know, you can, there's so many people now who are on TV who made a name for themselves on social media. Let's take Munya Chihuahua, for example. He's an amazing comedian, script writer. He, um, I actually met him for the first time when he was a producer, I think at Four Music. And I remember him saying to me, he's kind of gonna focus completely on his profile online. He's gonna create content. And now he has, you know, close to a million followers on social media. He has a show on Channel 4. He works with various brands. He's a great example of someone who didn't wait for someone to, or a company to employ him. He created his own space. Another person I would say is Mo the Comedian. First time I've, I ever heard an, or saw Mo was on his Instagram page. I thought he was absolutely hilarious. But he's, he was on, someone who was on the comedy circuit for years, grafting, working really, really hard. But at the same time, he created um, a profile for himself online. He didn't wait for anyone to kind of pick him up. And I think there's a lot of that that happens now where there's so much talent and you can't hide from it. Um, young Philly, Chunks, another set of guys who, you know, they created their, their own uh, platform online and now they can, you know, they're on TV, they're on radio, they're doing interviews, they work with amazing brands. So. It's great if you see yourself on the BBC, if you see yourself on ITV, if you see yourself on Channel 4, but do not wait for anyone to give you your opportunities. Create your own is what I believe. Right. So you have a lot of experience in TV and radio. So do you feel like broadcasters need to be balanced with experience and knowledge in both in order to break out in the industry? Annie, if I'm honest with you, like... I'm learning every day. I still make mistakes. I probably made a mistake yesterday. I probably made a mistake today on it. I don't think you can stop learning if you want to be a really good broadcaster. And I think people who care about their job, um, you know, they keep learning, they keep building on their knowledge. I remember my cousin always used to say to me, the moment you feel bored, 
doing what you're doing, that's when you need to change. Um, and I, you know, every day is exciting for me. So if you feel like you know loads about radio and you want to learn how to broadcast more on TV, then do that. If you want to learn how to do more, I feel like I'm learning all the time when it comes to online. I'm still learning about NFTs and I'm still learning about how to make content go viral. That's all, you know, brand new to me because I've, I've, you know, focused so much of my time on radio, on television, uh, on live events, on DJing, but there's always a new kind of element to the job. Um, so I think if you want to be really, really good at what you do, um, just keep learning across the board. If you see something and it interests you and you think, actually, I could do it, there's nothing stopping you from learning that aspect of the job. And my last question is, um, I'm really interested in this question. How did you get into the creative industry? What made you want to get into it? And what advice can you give to students who are looking to go to that route as well? Um, well, Annie, for me, it was, I wanted to be a singer or a dancer and then I realized I can't sing and dance. So I thought presenting was the next best thing. And um, when, when we left university, I started working with young people and um, I, I found it really hard to get into TV and radio. I actually came back to the university and there's an amazing lecturer called Janie Gordon and another amazing lecturer called uh, Anne Kate. And I, I remember coming up to them and, and I just felt really lost. And, and I said to, to Anne and, and Janie, I don't know what to do. And they were like, Melvin, look, you're working with young people. You're working in a youth club, you're teaching. So why don't you merge the skills that you've learned at university and your connection with young people and try and find a job in that kind of direction? And that's when I got the opportunity to work with CBBC. I, I never thought about working uh, on kids' television until I had that conversation at university. Um, and I think it's about just keeping your mind open um, when it comes to opportunities. Because when, you, when you're good at your job, and you're, I always believe work breeds work. So if you do something really, really well, another opportunity will arise. Um, so, yeah, I, I think... I was really lucky, I worked hard, I didn't give up, I made an amazing network of people because if I'm honest with you, Annie, there's someone in your class who's going to be a really, really big exec somewhere or is going to be working on a show or on a channel and if you remain friends with them, they can provide you with an opportunity. Um, so it's about really thinking about your network that you're, you're building now, being really, really good, um, at what you do and not giving up. Okay, thank you. That is all from me. Um, I think I'm going to pass back to Jose. Thank you, Jose. Hello, Thanks, Annie. <laughs> Hello, Melvin. Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Jose. Jose Gonçalves. I'm Portuguese. I'm 46 years old. I'm a mature student, but as I say, it's never too late to try. It's never too late to try to achieve our dreams and that's what I'm doing and I think I'm in the best place to do it because the University of Bedfordshire, uh, it works like a huge family and because this is a huge family, Melvin, am I allowed to say to you, welcome back home? Yeah, of course, of course, as long as you're cooking, I'm good. <laughs> This um, this uh, this evening is uh, it's uh, it's coming to 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 a, to a draw, and I think it's it's the right moment to 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 have from you some reflections. Um, looking back, um, did you had any inspiring role modelings uh, growing up? Uh, another great question there, uh, Jose. For me, um, my mum and my sister have been amazing role models there two really strong, empowering black women who raised me and made me feel so comfortable growing up and supported everything that I did. And they kind of gave me the confidence to do what I do. They're like my biggest fans. And sometimes if I don't believe in myself about something, they'll believe in me a million times more and, and allow me to have that courage and bravery to, to do the next gig. Uh, and I love them to bits. Um, but when I'm talk, if we talk about um, you know the wider world, 
Um, I've been lucky enough to meet some really cool celebrities in our time who've inspired me. I remember watching Richard Blackwood um, at university, actually, and he used to do a show called Lick, uh, The Lick on MTV. And I just remember sitting there thinking, I wish I could do something like that. And so now he's, you know, he's a really good friend. And um, even till this day, he's really supportive of what me and Ricky and Charlie do. Um, and it's, you know, for me, sometimes I don't, sometimes I don't want to say it, but I, you know, I'm still a fan of him. And so it feels really, really well, weird to be in a space where people who were my heroes, like your Richard Blackwoods, like your Trevor Nelsons, uh, are now friends of ours within the industry. So yeah, we're, there's a few role models, not, not just one. Yeah, it's, it's uh, also one of the most uh, interesting things about this industry. It's to get uh, direct contact with celebrities, let's say. Uh, who was, throughout your career, who was the, the, the most interesting person that you ever interviewed? Oof, that's a tough one. I mean, Rihanna's a good one, Sylvester Stallone's a great one, Denzel Washington. But um, I think the one that always touches me is Will Smith. We've been blessed to, to meet him a few times. And Will is, is the kind of guy who goes out of his way to make you feel special. Um, he remembers your name. He will come into a room and see how you are. Um, I remember one time we did an interview for his film Hancock and you, you kind of do interviews at hotels and they're called junkets. So myself and Ricky did this interview with him in the daytime and then he had the premiere on the red carpet later on that evening. So I went down to the red carpet event and I sat on the front row with my friend and Will came down the aisle with like the whole cast. So I think it was like Charlie's Veron, um, and like everyone was screaming and chanting and cheering. And as he left the cinema, he noticed me from earlier on that day. He gave me like a handshake and then walked out the cinema and everyone was like, how do you know Will Smith? And I was like, don't worry about that. Me and Big Will are like close, close friends. And that's, it's those little things like that that just make you feel so special. And that's why I love Will Smith so much. He just goes that extra mile. He always gives you the best interviews. He always gives you the best anecdotes. And he always, you know, um, makes you feel so important, uh, like the most important person in that room. So he's the, you know, he's a guy that I really look up to and um, always inspired by. That's really awesome. And once looks like I am in charge of the of the tough questions. Uh, let me let me ask you um, from what uh, what of your many achievements makes you most proud? Wow, Jose, that's a tough one because there's there's too many to 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 think about. Like um, our first time we we did ra a radio show. Our first ever radio show on Kiss was a big deal. When we got the live lounge, that was a big deal. When we hosted Wireless Festival, when we did the MOBO Awards, when we've got the first ever game show hosted by two black presenters on ITV, Bang on the Money, that was a big deal. When I was able to save up enough money to buy my mother a car, that was a big deal. So for me, it's, it's all like one big achievement and I'm, I'm proud of all of them. Uh, so yes, it's hard to pick one if I'm completely honest with you. Um, but yeah, there, there's a few to choose from, I think. Okay, Melvin, thank you very much for this evening. Now, I guess it's with Rebecca. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Thank you all very much for your really good questions. So I'm going to pick up a few from the audience for you, but I, I'd like to ask a question myself, first of all. So dancing, Melvin. Have you carried on? Have you carried on since Strictly? Are you still fit? Are Listen, still Rebecca, if you, if you want to hit the clubs with me tonight, just ask. You don't have to go around the houses. We can go somewhere later on today. Don't worry, we'll talk about it later. Toby will be the DJ for the night and you'll be there. Look, you don't want to go out with your auntie, do you? Now, come on. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but, you know what? I, I haven't done any major routines like Strictly. But in the club, I still shake a leg and I've kept in contact with a lot of the Strictly uh, alumni. So like a lot of the dancers like Jeanette Manrara, Ali Ash, they live quite close to me. Um, you know, they sometimes invite me to their shows or the actual Strictly show itself. 
Um, Neil, who's another pro dancer I'm still really close to. Some of the other celebrities like Ore Adube and stuff like that who I still speak to. So I'm really, really lucky to have that kind of like collection of mates who I've made, made from the show. But in terms of that level of dance, it hasn't happened in a while. Yeah, well, I mean, it is very, very professional, isn't it? And you obviously did very well, but you've, you've also done more dancing. And I understand you're familiar with dancing in custard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was my uh, my dick and dog in the bungalow years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh -huh. that was a very messy time. Yeah. <laughs> so, what do you have a favourite moment from Dick and Dom? Somebody would like to know. Um, <laughs> so there was a, an episode where um, <laughs> Dick and Dom were giving birth to custard babies, and it was just—I just remember thinking it was the craziest moment on the show for me in the history of the show but there were there were so many funny moments and a lot of them didn't actually happen on screen we had this really cool um producer called steve ride and he'd be in everyone's ear he'd be in like my ear richard and dominic's ear and he would say the funniest things and just it was a, such a, a family vibe on that show it's actually one of the best shows i've ever worked on in my life um and it, everything was so spontaneous, but it was like organized chaos. Um, but yeah, them giving birth to Custard Babies was hilarious. Our last ever show where we did like a Bugsy Malone kind of musical was really, really cool. Then ended up getting covered in custard was really funny. And just we had loads of silly random characters. It was always the things that were unplanned that I loved about the show. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Terrific. So at the moment, you know, there are so many ways in which people can listen to music, listen to podcasts, listen to, you know, take apps, stream in all sorts of ways, smartphones, you name it. How can radio remain relevant and keep hold of its audience when there is so much, you know, so many other ways in which people can access that kind of entertainment? What, what's your view on that? I think, um, I think like everything, if you want to remain important and relevant you have to revolve uh, if you think about radio one how long it's existed for and we created a platform called bbc sounds where you can listen to um radio live where you can go back to past shows where you can uh, listen to exclusive content you can listen to radio one you can listen to radio two there's a dance station there's all this a plethora of of content on one app which all comes on your device and Radio 1 could have just gone, well, we're Radio 1, we're a big station, we're just going to stay here on the FM dial. But they didn't. They've gone, look, there's all these other platforms that exist, so we have to create uh, something, you know, that can match up to all this other stuff that's going on. And that's evolving. And I think it's, that's not just um, technology, that's you as a broadcaster, that's you as a producer. If you want to remain relevant, then you have to evolve with what's going on in the world. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, you, you're a dinosaur, aren't you? And you, you know, you just lose your audience. Absolutely. Adapt, adapt or die. Yeah. Um, some people are interested in when you get into your world of work, how much kind of autonomy do you have over things? You know, are, are you just having to fit into what other people tell you to do? Or do you have uh, input into the kind of content and the format of the shows that you're, you're involved in? Um, how much is I mean, you doing? how much is other people, you know, how much is other people? I mean, for, for us as, you know, we're really lucky because I think people buy into our brand because we are ourselves. And I think with radio, it's such an intimate uh, form of media that you can't pretend to be anything else. You have to, you have to be yourself. People can see right through it. But again, at the same time, as someone who works for the BBC, there are certain rules that I have to adhere to i can't say anything that's going to be too offensive or too political because i work for a public service broadcaster you guys are essentially pay my bills so there's certain things that i have to you know um uh, adhere to but generally i i can be myself i can speak my mind and i think uh when you do something like radio it, it, you you can't not be anything else because people will, will kind of see through it yeah, I think that's right. And and you've got to let your personality come through as well, haven't you? And that's what people are listening for or watching for. 
Um, so I, I think that's a, a very important distinction that you've drawn there. So um, you come from Luton. You do come back to Luton because you come and see us, and I guess you may still have family there. Um, what did Luton mean to you as you were, you know, a student and in your life more generally? Well, I'm originally, I'm, uh, well, I'm, originally from, I'm originally from North London, but stayed in Luton on campus. So I was at Luton for three years. I stayed uh, in halls for one year and then we got like a little house. Um, and I do come back every now and then, like I've done a few talks. Uh, there's an amazing lecturer called Rachel Clark, who works uh, for the media performance department and she's done various um, Q and A's and um, lectures for me to come down and see the university. And I'm always proud when I come come back to Bedfordshire because um, I I'm so excited about the new talent that's there. People like Toby, who you know, every time we've you know we've done tech tests before that, he's sitting in that studio. He lives. He's going to be one of those guys who lives and breathes radio. I'm so excited about that. I can't wait to see what he goes on to do. Um, because it reminds me of what we were doing back then. And I look about, I look at how much have developed the technology that exists in that building. And it excites me because we didn't have some of the technology that you guys have in there now. Um, we were using like, I think reel to reels had just stopped being used um, when we started at university and we just started using stuff like Adobe. Now that's, there's several versions of it now. So I don't, I can't imagine what radio is going to sound like in the next few years, but it really excites me. So every time I come back to to the university, I'm I'm really really happy and I'm so proud of everyone, and I'm really happy that you guys keep asking me back because it it is a beautiful thing to be part of it. And and like I said, it was one of the best times of my life being at university. And you know, about twenty years ago, I was there. Mm -hmm. So. Breakfast shows have been a big part of your life. I guess you've got used to getting up early for all of that. What what makes a good breakfast show? What what are the good ingredients for a good breakfast show? I I think I, I mean I can't talk about for other breakfast shows, but I think the thing that um, that made our breakfast show special was the energy um, and the the dynamic and chemistry. I would go as far to say that I don't think there's a uh, there was a, a breakfast show that had chemistry better than that. Um, we are family. I don't regard Ricky and Charlie as my friends. I regard them as, as my family members. I spend more time with them than I do with some of my own family. Um, and I wholeheartedly trust them. And um, like I said, I, le I learn from Ricky and Charlie every single day. I think they're, they're both amazing broadcasters. Charlie was at KISS before we even got there. She was doing work experience like when she was like 15, 16. So she, it feels like she was born in a radio station. Uh, Ricky, he actually went to the Brit School before he came to the University of Bedfordshire. So he had already had so many skills. As you know, Brit School had alumni like um, Adele there, uh, Kate Melua, Tom Holland went there, um, uh, Amy Winehouse. So when I met Ricky, I was like, wow, like you are really cool creative person and so to be in a space like the university of bedfordshire and meet people like ricky was a really really nice place because i'd never met like-minded people like that before who wanted to do what i wanted to do so it kind of speared me on and it was like friendly competition it was really nice so thank you so your your talent and your passion really burn through when when you're talking and and some of our uh, guests are interested to know what what you know what else you might do if you hadn't done what you're doing now or even in the future like would you consider being a you know a serious actor is that something you've uh, thought about? I, you know what i did actually want to be an actor before i started uni and i just found it really scary um like being in front of an audience directly in front of you at the time is is so funny, and um, I always found it really hard to remember my lines. Um, acting is my my sister's actually an, actually an act, actress, and she's really good at her job, and she's studied for years, and she goes to workshops and classes. She's been to America and done stuff, and she's worked on like Coronation Street and Bulletproof on on um, Sky and stuff. And she, for me, she's like a real actress. She 
she's learned her trade and she's very good. And she went to the university as well. Um, and so when I see people like her who are really, really good, I, I feel like it's a really hard thing for me to do because I haven't done that much work when it comes to acting. But it's something that I would love to do. If someone gave me the opportunity, I'd definitely take it. If Top Boy are watching right now and they want someone, a bald guy with a beard on the show, then I'm happy to do it. But it's, it's a tough thing to do acting. But if I wasn't doing presenting or broadcasting, I'd probably be a teacher. Yeah, I, I can see you as, a, as all of those things, actually, but certainly a very, very good teacher because, you know, as I say, your enthusiasm shines through and, and your knowledge as well. Just just shifting us into a slightly more serious area. Um, and it's really about it's about racism and it's about inclusivity and diversity and, and how, how you've, ex, you know, what, what your experience has been in the media industry and, and do you think things are getting better? Do you see things improving on that front in terms of who's hired, in terms of representation more generally? Um, and, and, you know, any, any reflections on your own experiences there? Um, yeah, I do think things are changing. I think it's everything's happening really slowly. And, you know, when I first started in radio, I remember uh, Lenny Henry was, you know, on a mission to, you know, get more diversity on TV. And it felt like people were listening, but we're still talking about it, you know, eight, seven years, seven, eight years later on. So, yeah, things are changing, but it's happening really, really slowly. Um, I think in terms of my own experiences, I just think, you know, me and Ricky always wanted to be these mainstream broadcasters. And I think sometimes when you make that decision to become a mainstream broadcaster, you kind of have to dilute some of your, your blackness to make other people feel comfortable. Um, and I think, I feel like some of our young broadcasters don't have to do that as much. And I hope people like myself and Ricky and Lenny Henry and Richard Blackwoods and Reggie Yates and Trevor Nelson have kind of helped to open those doors so that people like Mo the Comedian and people like Chunks and people like Young Philly can come through and can be themselves. Um, but yeah, I think it's, and I don't think racism is just a, a thing that happens within our media industry. I think it's a thing that happens within society. I can't tell you, Rebecca, how many times I've been stopped in my car. I can't tell you about when I was a 15 year old coming out of a venue and getting stopped by two police vans for no reason when I was even worried about drinking coffee. So it's not a, an industry thing, it's a society thing. And we're only going to get better if we do become more inclusive and more diverse. And so it's great. When I turn on my TV and I see um, Asian people, I see black people, I see more women, I see people from different genders and sexual orientations on my screen and all these different shows and there's so much variety. For me, that's beautiful because it, it then becomes the norm. Do you know what I mean? I remember I've got some really good friends who work on the TV show Loose Women and there was a... Uh, day well they they had a week where they had a completely black panel which is you know it doesn't sound like a crazy thing but i remember at the time there was a bit of a backlash and um and then in the end they won like uh, an award a television award and 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 now it's kind of like a normal thing but it was uh, an all-white panel no one would have questioned it so it's, it's little things like that where you're like things are changing but it's a very, very slow process. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I just think we all do is, is create more opportunities and, and be more open-minded to things. And, and, and just, you know, I think it's about being brave. I think a lot of people are like um, scared to come out of their comfort zone because they think it's not going to work and they know a certain thing works, so they're not going to change it. But um, yeah, things are, things are happening, but slowly, I think. Yeah, I do. I do know what you mean. You wonder even if in our lifetimes, things will, you know, will really change significantly. And we shouldn't be noticing that there's, you know, that Loose Women has got an all black panel. We shouldn't even notice that that's the case, should we? But there, there we are. Um, just moving into some more personal uh, issues. People are interested in your own personal music choices. 
So, um, top three, <laughs> top three song requests. Okay, so today on the show, um, I played a new track by an artist called Omar Apollo, and it's a track called Invincible, featuring Daniel Caesar, and it's just like the intro to this song is too much. And when I first heard it, I had it on repeat uh, for several times, like several times last night and even this morning. Um, another album that I'm loving or tune that I'm loving, uh, the whole Summer Walker album is, am is amazing. So definitely worth checking that out if you haven't already. Um, and I am a big fan of Anderson Pack and Bruno Mars. Um, I think that their work together has been amazing. I love their album and um, it's got a beautiful retro vibe to it. Um, and I've come from like a background where um, like both my mum and dad were really into soul and jazz music. So um, hearing them kind of like um, reinvigorate that genre of music and, and make it so relevant to, to today is a beautiful thing. So yeah, Bruno Mars, Anderson Pack, Summer Walker, Omar Apollo are my recommendations for you guys. Fantastic. And did, did you come from a musical family? Obviously, you've got some genes that are creative in the family somewhere and your sister as well. But did were they musical in the family? My family loved the party. My dad can weirdly play the, the hand drums. He's really good on the, the hand drums. He never shows it off, but I've seen him before and he's really good at that. But yeah, they're more they're more party animals. They, they don't need an excuse. For a party, if you're opening a, a bottle of orange juice, they want to celebrate it. That's what my family are like. So we've always had music in the background and all different genres. My mum used to love country and western. Um, she used to love like kind of like swing, you know, like uh, stuff like Frank Sinatra and stuff like that. And then my dad was really into jazz and he loved soul. And, um, and yeah, just there was always music playing in the house. Um, so I think that's where I got it from and, and it's really funny because if you go to my mom's house now there's all this really cool vinyl which at the time I didn't really care about but when I look back on it it's, it's really amazing um, and then my friends I've got this a really um, close unit of friends who are, are like my brothers and um, you know we, I used to go to their houses and we used to freestyle and, and try and rap in bedrooms and stuff like that and yeah, just having them in, in my life kind of got me to, to love music. So yeah, the, if, uh, friends and family were, were the foundations of my love for music, mm -hmm. I'd say. Mm -hmm. it, it's a shame, isn't it, that schools are now so, well, relatively limited in the way that they can support music, you know, and I know musicians across all, all sorts of music uh, genre are very concerned about, you know, children in school not having access to, opportunities to be creative with music or to learn you know, to learn music to learn to read music even you know all of those things do you do you do you get involved in schools at all or you know going into work yeah, with young yeah i mean I've gone back to, um so my old school teacher she works in a school in north london so i've done a, a a few talks there i've done various talks around north london for different schools and yeah going back to the live music thing i it's a really tough time and I think our, our young people and our students have been absolutely amazing during this, this pandemic because, you know, I took for granted that I can meet up with my mates and go to a club and listen to my favourite bands play, do you know what I mean? And I think a lot of the what we learn and a lot of what we consume happens on our screen. Even if we take this event here, for example, it was something that would have been usually done live in a, a big room, an auditorium in front of an, an audience of people. But because of the, the life and times that we're living in right now, it's all happening virtually. So I'm so, like I said, I'm so proud of our, our young people now. And, you know, I don't want them to be disheartened because, you know, you do have platforms like YouTube. I sit online and I watch amazing drummers do what they do, guitarists do what they do. So there is a world out there where you can still enjoy and consume and love and learn music and it all exists there. But it is it is a really tough time. So yeah, I just want to like say well done and big up to all our students, all our young people who are watching right now because you guys are living in a tough time and you've done tremendously well. Like this is not the norm, guys. Things will go back to normal really soon, but you're handling it really well. Anyone who's studying and you're feeling stressed, 
you're allowed to feel stressed because this life and time is not normal. You guys are amazing. You're superheroes to me. That is a great point at which to pause and just say thank you so much for your insights and your engagement this evening. It's been fantastic to hear from you. You just come across as such an exciting person and I would just love to be your auntie, so please adopt me. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, auntie, I'll see you in the club. So, um, so thank you, thank you, Melvin. So uh, just a few thank yous before we say uh, good night. So thank you to you very much. Uh, lots of lovely comments coming through, you know, really nice to hear your thoughts on so many things. Thanks for always supporting the university. It's so important that students know that you can go on to the kinds of careers that you've you've gone on to you know we really want our students to to aim high to be ambitious about what they can achieve you know whatever kind of one they come from we're open at bedfordshire and we really want them to have that kind of experience that you've had as well I want to say thank you to first sight media for hosting us this evening thank you to everybody in the audience and thank you to those of you who've posted questions i hope we covered some of them not all of them but we've run out of time so that's always the case isn't it we have some more of these coming up um, these evening widths we've got um, carrie grant coming up we've got sir jonathan van tam coming up and lisa wainwright so i hope those will be good fun as well so if you look on our web pages, you'll, you'll find uh, uh, further information about those and do join us for those. So in the meantime, thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Melvin. Good night, everybody. Thank you.